Like it or not, there's a stigma attached to being the second of something. A first work is often celebrated for its seeming originality and freshness. After all, the creator has had their entire lives to envision, manifest, and refine their product. Ah, but when it comes time for that second novel, album, or film, well, expectations are rarely met. Perhaps the first one just set too high of a standard, or maybe there's the perception that part two is just more of the same. This is just as true for comics as anything. Think about all of the hype attached to a first issue. There's ads in the comics and trades, buzz on the internet and your local playground, and then, well, things go a little quiet. Today, we're looking at three of Atlas Comics' sophomore offerings, and I feel okay about that because we've already looked at the first issues. You can check out the links at the description below if you want to get caught up, but you don't really need to. We're going to jump in with both feet. So, how did these second issues stand up to their premier counterparts? Well, grab your plant fertilizer and your tiger skin suit. It's time for breakfast. Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. The Atlas Comics Group was established in 1974 by successful publisher Martin Goodman, former owner of Marvel Comics. The story goes that Cadence Publishing, Marvel's new owner, reneged on a promise to install Goodman's son, Chip, as publisher, Instead, wisely going for the far better known impresario of Marvel, Stan Lee. This chafed Goodman in no small part because he was Lee's uncle, who'd given the young man his start in the publishing field in the first place. Determined to show up his former company, Goodman assembled a cadre of creators under the revived Atlas Comics banner and dropped more than two dozen titles on the newsstands over the next year and a half. It did not go well. In spite of his influence, wealth, and a lifetime of connections, Goodman couldn't get lightning to strike twice. Marvel's newsstand prominence was based on now-established properties and a distribution network that allowed them to produce as many titles as they wished. Flooding the market pushed Atlas Books to the margins, keeping them from readers that may have otherwise embraced something new. Or at least something slightly different, as most of the Atlas Books slavishly aped Marvel's output. Sure, they were a little edgier, with more language violence and adult situations, but we're still safely in superhero territory here. I mean, check out Tiger Man number two. It's the same old story. Boy meets Tiger, Tiger mauls Boy, Boy is given the murdered tiger skin and gains its animalistic powers. You know, like that. Night in New York City Three brightly clad characters slip onto the empty street through a newly created hole in a building wall. Their nocturnal activities do not go unnoticed as Tiger Man watches from above. He quickly moves to intercept the trio, but before he can drop from his vantage point, two security guards arrive on the scene. Instead of fleeing, the trio advance, despite coming under fire. Their strange suits are not only bulletproof, but deliver electrically charged blows to boot. The guards are killed by the powerful discharge, but before the villains can congratulate themselves, Tiger Man leaps into the fray. The feline fury quickly dispatches two of the men, rending them brutally with his razored claws. Before the third can escape, he too is assaulted by the vengeful figure. The electrical device powering his suit is torn from his chest, and Tiger Man demands to know who sent them. 
with a bit of physical persuasion, the criminal spills his guts. They were sent by Professor Anderson Cobart of Manhattan University. Satisfied, Tiger Man springs off again into the night, quickly ascending to the rooftops in his own unique style. Only he's not alone, a shadowy presence watching from above. The figure follows his prey across the skyline, drawing in close to strike. Stepping into the light, we get our first look at... The Blue Leopard! Sure, why not? His tiger senses tingling, our hero reacts, narrowly dodging his new foe. Startled, Tiger Man struggles to compensate for the leopard's attacks, but his enemy is oddly familiar with his fighting style. Worse still, he knows Tiger Man's secret identity. The two grapple, with the leopard getting the better of our title character. It's then the leopard lets slip the name Nabantu, which loosens the formerly silent Tiger Man's tongue. We learn the leopard has been sent to America to find and kill his target, but only at the time of his choosing. Tired of being swatted around, Tiger Man goes on the offensive, boxing his foe's ears before clobbering him with a chop and a kick. However, his advantage is short-lived as the world begins to darken around him. Realizing he's been drugged, Tiger Man slumps to the rooftops, his foe's taunts ringing in his ears. And because a drug trip makes an excellent excuse to have a flashback, well, we're treated to our hero's pulse-pounding origin. Peace Corps volunteer Dr. Lancaster Hill is doing missionary work in Africa. Striving to isolate nature's survival instinct by needling this big kitty, Hill experiments on himself, injecting... Wait, is this that tiger blood that Charlie Sheen was all hopped up on a while back? Whatever the heck he's trying to do works, but before he can revel in his success, dissenters release the tiger. The two battle in a death match, with Hill emerging the bloody victor. He returns to America with his newfound powers, along with a super suit made out of the tiger that attacked him. The drug having run its course, Tiger Man wakes up the next morning and changes back into his civilian identity. With a little small talk between the doc and a nurse to establish he's more than just a weirdo in a suit, we're off to check in on Aunt May. Ah, Mr. Ditko, you so crazy. With that, it's back into Harness for Hill with Tiger Man catching a ride from a passing truck. I guess they won't let him on the bus dressed like that, huh? After a little guilt mining on the author's part, Tiger Man pays a visit to Professor Anderson Cobart, but... To his horror, the professor has been killed. Even worse, it's the work of the Blue Leopard, who's framed Tiger Man for the crime. Our hero demands answers, and surprisingly, Blue Leopard volunteers them. Hey, he might be a vicious murderer, but at least he's forthcoming. Turns out he was sent from the village where Hill was volunteering. Our hero has earned the ire of the village witch doctor, who has given his charge, amped up leopard powers, and a groovy suit to go with. However, instead of just splitting, the leopard attacks Tiger Man. But this time, our hero is ready for him. Tiger Man moves quickly to dodge the leopard's razor-sharp talons. Then the two face off, but before things can get slashy, the heat shows up and the blue leopard splits the scene, leaving Tiger Man to contemplate his recent actions. Exciting stuff. Atlas clearly had faith in their tigerific new hero, as he not only appeared here, but in the Thrilling Adventures magazine as well. And those stories could be even edgier than this four-color version, thanks to looser magazine restrictions. Tiger Man would soon face cancellation along with the rest of his gritty brethren. Hmm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Our next book is issue number two of The Destructor, one of Atlas Comics' most successful titles. It reached issue four. <laughs> Clearly the company felt that superheroes were their best bet, so they loaded their books up with them. Now, I remember seeing this advertised in other comics back in the day and thinking... Eh, yeah. Kirby-esque? Could be cool. Well, there's only one way to find out. Night and snow has come to the waterfront of Harbortown. Meet the syndicate, criminals importing some hot property under the cover of darkness. Not to worry, the destructor is on the scene. 
He wades into the criminals, making short work of the surprised men. Then, our hero senses scream as the still-loaded truck comes barreling towards him. He drops, twists, and rolls, making it to the driver's side door. Wrenching the wheel, the destructor sends the truck careening into the river. Rising, the destructor advances on Lash, the leader of the gang. The criminal is intimidated by his new foe, spilling some seemingly critical information. We learn that the boss of bosses is Big Mike Brand, who has a hideout down Mexico Way. This is enough for the destructor to let Lash live, leaving the follow-up on this new lead. Lash, however, is not alone, a mysterious cloaked figure stepping from the shadows. Across town, the Destructor, a.k.a. Jay Hunter, drops heavily into bed, the events of the past hour leaving him spent. And, because passing out also makes an excellent excuse to have a flashback, well, we're treated to our hero's pulse-pounding origin. And with that out of the way, we pick up Lash and his cape companion, who've left the cold for the comfort of a luxury apartment. And it looks like it's a cross-up, as Lash turned over on his former boss, sending the Destructor to rub out their competition. So, who is this mysterious benefactor? Why, it's Death Grip, the villain from issue one. Ah, now it's all starting to make sense. Now that Lash has given Destructor the bogus info, he moves to dispatch the two-faced mobster. Hey, if you're not going to occasionally use your flesh-melting gauntlet, why even put it on in the morning? Death Grip melts the owl statue to warm up, then Flash fries Lash with a bolt of fire. Turns out Big Mike Brand is the man who ruined him, presumably by leaving him looking like Peter Lorre in Mad Love. We cut away to Jay, who's taking the direct route to Brand's Mexican hideout by... thumbing a ride? Hey, it's vengeance. No one ever said it was going to be fast. After a week with the Dharma bums, our hero has arrived in the land south of the border, where he lays a snake-based trap for Angela Brand, Big Mike's daughter. The sudden appearance of the Rattler startles the horse, who throws the unsuspecting Angela... But Jay is there to catch her, earning the ire of her approaching gangster father and his gunsel. However, once Bran realizes Jay has saved his daughter, he turns on the charm, inviting the lad back to the house for some lunch. Taking a shine to the lad, Bran offers him a job as a chauffeur. Accepting the position, Jay finds himself poised to exact his vengeance. It's then Tony Stark impersonator Glenn Thorne shows up to whisk girlfriend Angela off on a date, leaving Jay at home with Bran and his gunsel. Under cover of nightfall, the Destructor sneaks into Bran's office, finding paperwork that reveals Bran surrendered all control of his rackets weeks ago. The realization Lash has lied to him is fleeting as footsteps unexpectedly approach from outside. Our hero is winged by the gunsel as he escapes, vanishing into the night. The next day, Jay goes over to work on Bran's automobiles. He witnesses Angela and Glenn taking off on another date. And where's he taking her today? Why, the junkyard, of course. Nothing but the best for our Angela. And hey, look, Glenn is actually Hugo, the man of a thousand faces. No, it's just death grip in disguise. He's here to punish Bran by murdering his daughter. And he's creative, too, not just gripping her to death, but instead smushing her in a car crusher. Luckily, Jay appears to sort things out. Guess he lucked out hitchhiking this time. Death Grip grapples with his foe, effortlessly breaking the Destructor's arm. Our hero, blinded by pain, rips a nearby car door clean off its hinges, slamming his foe aside. However, two can play at that game. Death Grip batters the Destructor with a metal pipe, but our boy has built up one heck of a head of steam, and he knocks DG out with a stunning blow. He rushes to save Angela, ripping the car door open and hustling the gangster's daughter out before the electromagnet drops. Only Death Grip's stunned state was merely a ruse to get the Destructor close enough, so he's caught in the magnet's powerful grip. Luckily for our hero, Death Grip's glove is also metal, and the magnet isn't all that choosy. The villain is lifted high off the ground, then deposited in the crusher. And that's it for Death Grip. With that, the kids wander off, leaving the dump's morning crew to handle the cleanup. So yeah, 
It's no Tiger Man. It's not bad per se, but, well, there just isn't much of a spark here. Our hero is kind of an antagonistic butthole who thrives on violence and conflict. There's not a lot of nuance or depth. Granted, it's issue two and still early days, but as a reader, I just don't get a sense about what's redeemable here. Atlas and Ditko in particular might have been looking to play up the anti-hero angle, but there needs to be some relatable aspect to your character. If Peter Parker had been a schnook the entirety of his origin story, well, it's unlikely that he would have caught on quite the way that he did. It was Parker's acceptance of the fact that he was responsible for the death of his uncle that allowed his character to develop into something more relatable. The narrator here tells us about the Destructor's guilt, but it simply doesn't come across in the story. Seems like the kid just likes punching people. For all that, it's our next book that really pushes the meter as far as apropos comic character behavior. Now, this is Morlock number two, and, well, if you've read it, then you know what's coming. An artificial life form whipped up in a lab, Morlock is just like you or me. He only wants to be loved. He can't help it if his touch turns people into inert masses of vegetation or that he occasionally transforms into something that looks like it would clog your toilet bowl. Living in a future cobble from Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Orwell's 1984, and Burge's A Clockwork Orange, Morlock does his best to find some meaning in a world that he was just never meant to inhabit. It's just the sort of rambling, ramshackle narrative that made Alice so compelling. But did they really think they were going to topple Marvel with this stuff? Let's read on. Our little tale begins with this eye-opening splash page. Pretty distressing, but we cut away to the city's main square, where loudspeakers blare forth a shrill message. Morlock is wanted. Morlock's face appears on a huge screen, now public enemy number one. The local heat began demanding ID from the throng, but one man isn't as compliant. And hey, here's our Morlock now. Who says dragnets don't work? He's chased to the outskirts of town, but in true anti-hero fashion, Morlock hurls himself off a high bridge. And because this is a comic, well, a passing train breaks his fall. Morlock takes refuge in one of the rail cars, but it turns out he's not alone. Emerging from the shadows, a group of clockwork orange cosplayers begin to pester our shrubby pal. Unsuccessfully shaking him down for a bit of henkorm, it's time for a bit of the old ultraviolence, and the gang set about stealing Morlock's protective gloves. To their surprise, the lads begin to platch, their plots gone all mossy-wossy. Head to toe, and all verdant-like, they notchy, but before Morlock and Itty, the train comes to an unexpected stop. The station master catches Mori and his chlorophyll pals out, leading to this charming little transformation. Now that's the power of fiber, folks. After draining the station master like a high seed juice box, Morlock shuffles off. He returns to his less excremental state just in time to rescue a small blind child from... I don't know, hay-based yeti? We don't really get much of an answer up front, which is fine. Let's not get hung up here. Morlock engages the beasts, allowing the child to escape, but he's forced to the edge of a high cliffside. Luckily, the child's father has shown up, and he's brought some lawn maintenance gear in the form of a big honkin' flamethrower. The creatures go up like dried branches, and after the smoke clears, introductions are made. This is Bert Ling, or Bertling, I'm not really sure, the scientist responsible for creating these creatures. He's a molecular botanist involved in secret research, which seems like the sort of thing you'd need to keep to yourself. He's growing plant men in his greenhouse, which is of particular interest to Morlock, as he is just such a plant man. Perhaps Ling can cure him of turning into a murderous octoturd. We get a look at Ling's layout, which, by 1970s standards, is pretty fly. And hey, turns out Ling is connected to the scientist who spawned Morlock, furthering hope of a potential cure. Later that evening, the doctor toils in his lab. After all, until now, all of his creations have been bloodthirsty monsters. 
He just knows he can do better than that. Maybe try and cure your daughter's blindness first there, genius. A broadcast catches his attention, breaking his reverie. Why, it's Morlock, and he's wanted. Ling struggles to make a decision. Morlock did just save his daughter, but 500 credits? That's a lot of scrant. After a bit more back and forth, his mind is made up. He heads out to the room where Morlock rests. At gunpoint, he locks the fugitive in the barn, much to his daughter's dismay. But kids being kids, well, she waits in secret until Dad has gone inside, then drops in on Mr. Morlock. Only, wouldn't you know it, the stress has gone and turned him all monstery again. Instead of just leaving, the ambulatory mound of night soil turns upon his liberator, leaving nothing behind save her pink sweater and what appears to be a pool of grape robitussin. And Ling has the gall to get angry about this. There was only some way the mad scientist with a history of creating murderous vegetative life could have known that it might be dangerous. Oh, boy, open a window. Morlock, returned to his human form once again, feels guilty for about a minute, but hey, there's a sunset over there to walk off into. Keep going, buddy. Keep going. So, yeah. Suddenly the Destructor seems a lot more relatable, huh? I mean, there's anti-hero, and then there's straight-up murderer. Obviously, uh, the last uh, scene in the book is meant to parallel the infamous moments in the 1931 James Whale film Frankenstein, where the monster inadvertently kills the little girl by tossing her into the pond. But this misses the mark by so much that it's staggering. Bringing aspects of classic literature or cinema into your product is fine. That is, if you can do it with subtlety, grace, and honor. I mean, few things class up a bathroom than a Shakespeare quote, right? That said, it, here, instead of elevating the story, well, these aspects simply underscore the shoddy nature of the product. Why would I read this when I can just revisit the classics that inspired it? For all of its borrowing, Morlock 2001 doesn't really bring anything new to the table. That said, the book certainly does have a grindhouse quality that some folk may just find appealing. Definitely not for the faint of heart, though. Each of the titles that we've looked at today would get a third issue, but at considerable cost. At that stage in the game, it was clear to Goodman that his comics weren't exactly setting the world on fire, so he demanded sweeping changes. However, instead of rallying and doubling down on just what it was that made Atlas Comics so unique in the first place, Goodman instead demanded his books be even more like the competition. This led to alienating an already dwindling readership as well as generating consternation among his creative staff. Sadly, these changes were too little too late. By the end, newsstands weren't even opening their Atlas bundles, sending them back with the intention of sticking with the chosen winners. Soon after this, the company shuttered its stores for good, remembered rarely, if ever, by a fickle public. That said, for good or ill, I love Atlas Comics. The stories weren't often great, and the characters themselves could be seen as uninspired or derivative, but these books scratch an itch that other companies simply can't. Examples can still be found in dollar bins today, so don't take my word for it. Buy one for yourself and see. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider purchasing a mug, a t-shirt, or one of the other fine items that you can only find in the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics swag shop. Papa needs a new pair of everything. I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next Sunday at breakfast.